You're watching the award-winning VHA TV. This program is confidential. Duplication of this program without permission of VHA is prohibited, except for use by participating healthcare organizations. Hello and welcome to this special edition of VHA's 2013 Supply Chain Education Series. Based on your feedback as a viewer, we've developed programs to address the timely real-world education needs of those involved in healthcare supply chain management. Supply Chain Education Series is a monthly program that provides VHA hospital and health system supply chain professionals with information about leading practices and expert guidance on important issues. We're sharing today's program industry-wide because of the importance of the subject matter. In 2014, look for some additional special editions of the series when industry-shaping issues arise in healthcare supply chain management. I'm Mike Duke, your host, and I want to remind you that this program is interactive and we'd like to hear from you. So if you have a comment or a question at any time, be sure to use the Ask a Question button on your screen. Just type in your question or comment and click the Send button. Or you can send us an email to vhatvlive at vha.com. So today we're going to focus on the FDA's final ruling on unique device identification or UDI. We'll discuss ways UDI can bring value to your organization and potential benefits in supply chain management, clinical care, post-procedure tracking, and other areas. Our objectives are that we will describe the key requirements of the UDI rule and the major objectives for the rule. We'll define relevant terms such as GUDID or good ID, DUNS, GMDN, and OTC UPC. We'll outline UDI compliance states and delineate the focus areas of national level work and policy for UDI use. And finally, we'll list provider planning steps that should be considered today to facilitate the use of UDI. Now, to help us do this, we have two great guests who are making a return visit to the series. First up, Dr. Natalia Wilson from the Health Sector Supply Chain Research Consortium at Arizona State University. Natalia, tell us a little bit about your background and your role at the consortium. And Mike, it's really nice to be back here. Uh, again, especially talking on this topic. Um, I currently co-direct the Health Sector Supply Chain Research Consortium in the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University. Um, prior to this, I practice internal medicine, um, and now I focus entirely on research um, and research on the healthcare supply chain. And I'm particularly interested in those areas where supply chain and the clinical world merge or both have relevant um, issues. And for the past three or four years, I've been very involved in research and education um, on UDI use. And for the past year, I've had involvement with national level um, initiatives. Well, Natalia, welcome back to the program. We're very excited that you're here given the, the, the great knowledge and experience you have with this issue. And also joining us is Dennis Beyer from Novation. Dennis, tell us a little bit about your background and your role at Novation. Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. I am the uh, global healthcare standards leader for Novation. Now, I've been active in the standard space uh, for about 13 years. Uh, I consider myself to be an original uh, GPO member of CHES, the Coalition for Healthcare E-Standards. I've been the chairman a few times. I was one of the original group that uh, that implemented the GLN registry. And uh, actually, I met with the FDA in 2004 when I was the chairman of CHES um, at that time. And uh, it was at that point that they were first considering um, moving forward with the UDI. Uh, and so uh, I've been active uh, in the UDI space since 2004. Uh, and I am, uh, and Mike, I'm Novation's rep to uh, standards activities both nationally and globally. So thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you. We're very excited that you're here as well. Um, I think 
I think we should get started with a little bit of background about the UDI rule and, and uh, talk about the, the rationale behind it. Natalia? Sure. You know, the first thing I think is really important for us to think about is, you know, what FDA does. Um, and I actually got this right off of their website. Um, but FDA is responsible for protecting our public health. I mean, all of us, despite being professionals right now on this um, show, um, we are patients. We are the public. And so they really ensure our health in multitude of areas, but inclusive of pharmaceuticals, biologic products, and medical devices. Um, and so in 1999-2000, a very impactful report was released by the Institute of Medicine, a very well-known, credible um, group, um, called to air as human. I actually was practicing at the time that this came out. And in that report, they um, stated that between 44 to 98,000 patients die in U.S. hospitals due to preventable medical errors. Um, and so this very much precipitated FDA regulations um, in the areas of biologics, pharmaceuticals, and most recently, medical devices. I do want to mention um, that there was a recent publication in the Journal of uh, Patient Safety, actually just a couple of months ago, that has updated those numbers. And the thinking now is they're on the order of 200 to 400,000. That's incredible, and uh, I think everybody probably remembers to air as human, and that then uh, quite properly uh, precipitated a lot of different acts and, and some regulations starting to take hold by the FDA. Dennis, why don't you tell, talk to us about what happened after that report? All right, well, you know, I indicated that I started with the FDA back in 2004. Well, in the 2004 time frame was the first barcode rule that was passed by the FDA. This was the barcode label requirement for uh, pharma, essentially. And I'll have to say that the UDI is actually patterned a lot after um, this rule from the FDA. Now, to get the UDI started, the FDA Amendments Act was mandated by Congress back in 2007. Uh, five years later, so over that five-year period, we had several times when we thought the rule was going to publish, but it was finally uh, proposed in uh, July of 2012. Uh, that followed a comment period, or a comment period followed the publication of the proposed rule. There was also the Badesia Amendment, which included the life-saving devices, and there was a comment period for that as well. And finally here, uh, in 2013, we had the UDI uh, final rule and the Good ID draft uh, guidance. And, and the impact of this rule is that uh, this will enable hospitals to engage in scanning and automatic identification of products. So this is really key, I think, for the hospitals, this final rule and the opportunity to implement scanning. Well, and we, as, as you know, the, the to err as human illustrated, there, there's a vast, vast improvement needed in the area of patient safety. What are some of the global health drivers or objectives of, of the act? Well, one thing I, I just want to follow up on what Dennis brought up about the 2004 pharma barcode rule is really the intent of that um, was for hospitals to then barcode, use the barcode, scan the barcodes, and reduce medication error. So certainly that thinking has fast forward to our medical device rule, the UDI rule, and that same thinking is that now we need use of that. Um, in order to reduce um, error. Um, there are really important um, public health objectives um, for this rule, and patient safety is very much at the heart of this. And you'll hear me say that. It's something I'm very passionate about. I used to practice internal medicine as a primary care physician. But very important public health objectives, re reduction of medication, or not medication, medical error, um, simplifying our device use information in our IT systems, um, more rapid identification of devices that have adverse events, and then more rapid solutions to those problems. Um, greater efficiency in our recall resolution and management, and then just overall better FDA safety communication. And I think it's really important that we all, we don't lose sight of these public health objectives, because as I said, it's patient safety very much at the heart of this, this initiative. Right. And, um the act or the rule itself is pretty complicated. It's pretty voluminous. But why don't we start focusing on some of the major components of, of the rule? 
Sure, I just want to hit some of the highlights. I mean, certainly it, you can read the rule. I read it several times. It is kind of busy and long. Um, but as Dennis mentioned, the rule finally, the long-awaited rule came out September 24th of this year. Um, UDI will be required on the device label and packaging, um, of course, barring exception, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, the UDI is required in a human readable form and then an AIDC or automatic ID and data capture form. Um, there are two components of the UDI. There's a device identifier or DI that really reflects the manufacturer and model. Um, and then there's the production identifier or PI that really provides additional identifying information. So it could be the lot number, serial number, expiration date, date of manufacture. And then there's a specific code for um, cellular or tissue based products that are regulated as devices. So really providing that extra information. Um, devices that are intended to be used more than once and reprocess in between uses must be direct marked with UDI. And I want to mention two points with that. Um, number one, in the proposed rule, um, there was language that implantable devices would have to be direct marked. That did not make it into um, the, the final rule. Um, secondly, for those that are direct marked, the UDI on the packaging actually can be different than the UDI that's on the actual device with the direct marking. So I wanted to point that out to you because those are important um, kind of points as you get your arms around it, um, all of this information that we're presenting and that's out there now on UDI. Um, UDI um, only can be issued by FDA accredited issuing agencies. Um, right now, I'm sure that GS1, HIBIC, and ICCBBA are busy getting accredited by FDA. Those are our main three agencies currently. Um, there is device information that must be submitted to the Global Unique Device Identification Database, now called the Good ID, and we will get into that in just a moment. Um, and there are exceptions, and I don't want to get into all of the exceptions. I refer you to the rule. But some important ones are um, the devices that are already packaged and labeled. So um, already done, they could be in distribution prior to the compliance date, actually have a three-year grace period. Um, UDI is not required on things such as custom devices or those um, intended for export. Um, and when we think about a convenience kit, the individual devices in the kit do not need individual UDIs, but the kit needs a UDI. Um, and in the uh, case of class one devices, um, the production identifier is not required. Um, and um, if direct marking would interfere with device safety or effectiveness and obviously be a hazard for public health, um, that is also accepted. Um, the compliance dates out of the rule are very much dependent on device class. They start with the highest risk device, really as they should. Um, class three devices will require the UDI and submission to the good ID one year after the final rule was released. So that's September 24th, 2014. We're now about nine months from that. Um, implantable life-sustaining, life-supporting devices um, will require um, the UDI, good ID submission, and direct marking if it's required two years after the final rule. And I want to say sometimes these classes are kind of confusing, at least they are to me. Um, there is a reference because there is a list for that implantable uh, group that I just talked about, and that's at the end of, um, of your handout. Um, and then class two um, will be three years after the final rule, class one, five years. Um, and then in the case of direct marking for anything except that implantable group, um, they're allowed an extra two years. So that will take us out to about seven years. Um, and also important to note, class three manufacturers may request a one year extension of their compliance date if it's felt to be in the, the best interest um, of public health. Natalia, <clears throat> blood and tissue products, which, which class are they grouped into, by the way? Well, you know, off the top of my head, I don't suspect that they're just in one class. Oh. I'm thinking that they might cross classes. I think it, it's really um, if they have that component and they're regulated as a device. Maybe there's some class three. Maybe they fall into class two. I don't know exactly um, all the classes they fall okay. into. Thank you. Sure. Something something we all have to learn more about. And But that does mean, though, that uh, implants in the cardiovascular and orthopedic segments will have UDIs, if they don't already, uh, by September 2015. 
in about a little less than two years. So yeah, and also we'll have to submit the data information into the good ID, which we don't have currently, obviously. Okay. Hey, before we go into more detail <laughs> and look at focus areas affecting UDI policy, would you define some of the key terminology uh, involved, Dennis? Um, all right, so let's start with the first definition, and this is the Global Unique Device Identification Database, what we're calling the, the Good ID, uh, and this is the database that will serve as the repository for all device information. So uh, potentially a provider, if you're going to uh, be doing some scanning of your products, you'll be able to get uh, supporting data from that Good ID database. Well then, the second definition is the GMDN, the Global Medical Device Nomenclature. Um, and this is a classification system. Uh, it's used more internationally, I think it's used more in Europe, uh, but every product will be, um, will be required to have a GMDN term associated with it. Um, Dennis, I know in our handout, we've got definitions too for DUNS, uh, OTC and UPC. So they're covered as well, and, and, and our, our viewers can look at them in the handout. Um, I'm not familiar, though, with one of these. This is a new one, GMDN. And does this compare to classifications we already have in the industry? Well, I, I think from the provider perspective, the GMDN compares to the UNSPSC. Um, I think a major difference is that um, with the UNSPSC, uh, uh, folks that are using the standard can contribute to adding to the standard itself. I'm not sure exactly how the GMDN gets its terms and its information, uh, but I would say from a provider perspective, the GMDN uh, compares favorably to the UNSPSC. Um, another definition that we want to talk about is the labeler. Uh, this is any person who causes the label to be applied to the device. Um, let me see here. So here's one that, that kind of threw me. This is HCP slash T. And uh, this uh, stands for human cells, tissues, or cellular, or tissue-based products, which are regulated as a device. So that was actually a new term for me. Uh, and the last definition, I think, or towards the end of the definitions, is issuing agency. Um, this is an agency, an organization that's been accredited by the FDA to operate a system for um, unique identification. So uh, issue, issuing agency, is like HIBIC or GS1 right. or that other one with the new acronym. Um, and then um, labelers are essentially the manufacturer or in the case of a convenience kit, the kit packer. So I know there's been a little con little bit of confusion about that. Now, you both have referenced Good ID, um, which is the repository where all this information will reside. Let's explore some of its attributes. Sure, the, the labeler um, must submit device information to the good ID, and this information will be publicly available. Um, so I want to run through what, is, what was presented or is in the final rule um, and the requirement for submission to the good ID. A um, lot of information, I'll just run through it quickly because you have it in your handout, but certainly the labeler, who the labeler is and their contact information, who the issuing agency is, um, what the DI component of the UDI is, and if it's the substitution, what was the previous DI. Um, in the case of direct marking, you have to check if it's the same DI that's on the packaging or direct marked, or if it's different, to provide that um, different DI. Um, brand name, model number, um, and then some clinically important attributes. Is this product or device sterile? Um, does it contain natural latex? What about MRI compatibility? Um, that was actually a new inclusion from the proposed rule, um, or since the proposed rule. Uh, sizing of this particular model. Um, you don't have to put the production identifier, or, or the labelers don't have to put the PIs, uh, the actual PI, into the good ID, but what is provided in the label has to be listed. Um, and a couple FDA uh, specific numbers, um, the GMDN term, um, and the number of devices in each package. Um, I also want to mention at the same time that the final rule came out, um, the Good ID draft guidance for industry was released. Um, it just underwent its period of public comment. I think it ended at the, la at the end of last month. Um, and I was just in conversation with FDA about this because I noticed that there seemed to be more attributes in this industry guidance than in the final rule. And so 
the, my understanding is that they've taken sort of a list of attributes from the final rule and then made it practical to actually entering it to a database. Um, the, the guidance is not final yet, but it will be in the near future. And there's certainly the probability there will be other information, such as commercial distribution status, FDA pro code, package configuration, possibly if it's a kit um, or over-the-counter prescription, et cetera. So certainly keep your eyes open about when that document becomes final. Okay, and the repository will be available to all mm -hmm. uh, in the industry, for sure, the providers as well. We, we have a question uh, from our audience, and I'd like, to, I'd like to include it right now. It, starts, it actually starts off with uh, definition, so uh, Dennis, uh, uh, Natalia, you can weigh in as well. The unique device identifier includes the key to device-related information stored in the, in the database and ensures the unambig unambiguous identification of a specific product. The GS1 solution for creating device identifier of a UDI is the Global Trade Identification Number, or GTIN. How did, is that how GTIN and UDI really relate? Um, yes. <laughs> So that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. The G10 will be the UDI. Right. The UDI actually allows for three types of product identifiers. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, the, the first one is the GS1 G10, uh, and I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, and then the HIBIC LIC or the UPN is the second identifier that's allowed by the UDI. And then it's the uh, ISBT128 barcode for blood and tissues, and that would be the third identifier allowed with. Okay. So in, in my mind, a G10 and the UDI are um, somewhat equivalent. Okay, well, that's, I think that's good to know. And uh, those of, those of the, the audience that are implementing G10s are thinking about it, then uh, that will be the, the UDI ultimately, so that's good. Um, okay, so we've looked at the rule uh, and the global public health objectives behind it. Let's talk about some of the benefits and uses that are anticipated from UDI. Sure, the, I mean, really the ultimate goal here um, is a, what I would call holistic approach to integration of medical device information across healthcare and across healthcare systems. So we really have the same standard number that is reflecting a device as it travels across various parts of, of healthcare and being able to capture that in our IT system and for that to be consistent. Um, there is quite a lot of research, um, education, national level efforts ongoing that I'm going to get into are very important to, to know about. Um, and they're very much focused on building the clinical and business case for UDI use and also um, impacting policy change. You know, and Natalia, you have um, some great information you'll share later about, about some of that research and it, it's around the case for UDI and, and implementing it. But Dennis, let's, let's just talk a second about the business benefits of, of UDI use. All right. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I think the, uh, the most important thing about the UDI is the opportunity to implement scanning or automated identification. With that opportunity comes potentially a big change with how, uh, to how you match products uh, in the case of a recall, in the case of adverse events, uh, if you're comparing items in your item master to uh, data you get from other sources, the UDI becomes that common data element. And it becomes very powerful in the sense that it's FDA endorsed, uh, the, the good ID supports that UDI, and all of the other associated uh, tools are using that same number. So I'd say that's one big implication is that ability to match. So, I mean, it's unique. It's the same across the industry, across all stakeholders. And you're saying that the use of UDI will make product matching more accurate. Now, uh, we, we do a lot of product matching in our analytics area. Are you saying that in those operations, match rate could be 100%? Well, uh, so there's a voice going off in the back of my head right now that's saying, Dennis, don't say it's 100%. But really, conceivably, conceptually, it could be 100%. Now. Um, reality speaks, and uh, you know, it probably won't be exactly 100%, but we could have higher uh, match rates than what we have today. It, again, it's a powerful identifier. It's being used by all health healthcare constituents. Um, uh, and, and from that perspective, your ability to match and your ability to scan and do automated identification is huge. Now, a second area that I think you have to look at is your reporting capability. Um, we've already said that the 
that the UDI requires the use of a G10 or a HIBIC identifier or an ISPT-128. Uh, by the way, uh, the ISPT stands for International Standard for Blood and Transport. Thank you. Transplant, excuse me, not <laughs> yeah. transport. Transport. Um, so anyhow, I think most of the current reports just show a manufacturer part number. Uh, and so the requirement here is that your reporting has to show, when it's appropriate, the right identifier, the G10 or the HIBIC or the ISPT-128 code. Dennis, at a, at a more basic level, if you're a hospital that is interested in getting started in scanning, which is something you'll have to do if you want to effectively use UDI, what considerations should they have in terms of moving forward? Well, I think the number one consideration, uh, and I've actually talked to a lot of our members who are starting to investigate this. and. Um, I think the you know a, a hurdle is what do you do if there's no barcode on the product? Now, uh, the UDI is going to fix that problem, but as we go through this timeline, you're still going to have uh, occasions where the product doesn't have a barcode. So you have to have a process in place to put a barcode on a product. If you want to scan everything, you have to have a process in place to put it on. To, to to put a barcode on the product, uh, and potentially you're putting your own barcode on the product to make scanning happen. Yeah, but, I mean, if it's your own barcode, uh, don't you have to have a source for backend data to support that? Well, so, you know, Mike, it, it, it's amazing how this is all falling together, but, um, you know, there is a, uh, um, a need for backend data to support scanning. Uh, I think today I'm not aware of a single source for UDI data. Uh, I'm assuming that the GPOs um, and other third-party vendors will have uh, data available that will s support uh, scanning in the UDI operation. Natalia, what are your thoughts about um, a source for data? Well, the, the good ID is really a source of truth for UDI and with the list of attributes that, that I had um, brought up earlier. Um, I guess the next question is how hospitals and are in other patient care settings are really going to get that information, whether it's use of a third party, as you brought up, or directly. Um, and I think that's sort of in development. Um, we don't really have the good ID up and running quite yet because we haven't met the first compliance date. Dennis, if, the, if a hospital has to put a, a barcode on an unlabeled product, what, what barcode should they consider being used? Well, um, I, I've been hearing a lot about the 2D barcodes, uh, specifically the data matrix barcode. Uh, it tends to be a very powerful barcode uh, in the sense that you can embed a lot of data in the barcode. Uh, and so if a hospital was going to identify products with their own barcode, I would probably recommend that they, look a, that they take a good look at the 2D data matrix barcode. Okay, now we've, we've talked, uh, we talked briefly about public health objectives. Um, we've talked a fair amount now about business and, and compliance dates and the business application. But Natalia, there are some very important implications and impacts on the clinical side of the business. Why don't you cover those for us now? Yeah, and there absolutely are, and this really gets back to patient safety, and this is an area I'm very passionate about. And in fact, when I early on when I was starting to hear about UDI and think it through, intuitively it seemed there was so much benefit from a clinical standpoint and, and for patients and their caregivers. Um, but, but one of those areas um, is, is to clearly document in a standard fashion in the electronic health record devices, particularly implantable devices that have been used in a patient. Um, that becomes very important. I mean, first of all, if there's a recall, so you can query the electronic health record via UDI, um, unlike, you know, currently when we have a lot of manual aspects of that and, and um, very time consuming, et cetera. Um, it also sets up that if a, if a surgeon needs to do a revision um, surgery or there's an emergency procedure as such, you have clear information of what's already in, in a patient's body. Um, per the final rule, UDI will be required in adverse event reports um, to the MAW database at the FDA. So this is really important so FDA can get clearer and complete records so they can start pulling data together because if a device is not doing well, we want to know about it as soon as possible, again, to really support patient safety. Um, and as we move forward to UDI in electronic health records and hopefully in claims data, we are really uh, starting to tee up um, a lot of device information for post-market surveillance and really see how devices um, are performing once they're out on the market. 
Um, and, and a goal as, as we move forward with all of this is to scan UDI at the point of care for really multiple purposes. So we get information for supply chain, we get information for billing, we get clinical documentation, and then ultimately you can start to pull that data together. For, uh, for analysis, so bring things such as cost and percentage of reimbursement um, and length of stay and readmission, et cetera, together, and that's an arena we really haven't been very effective at doing. So surrounding devices and procedures, we are starting to, to see that we might be able to do that. Um, and I think implantable devices will ultimately be a very good model for UDI because some of the regulation and some of what I'm going to get into later is going to really start impacting implantable devices first for device, uh, medical device tracking and, and all of that. So I think it's a really good model to see how we're going to do it with these type of devices um, and then we can translate that hopefully to other classes of devices as they come down the pike. You know, it, it seems to me that um, we'll scan devices at the patient bedside or in the surgical suite, they'll become part of the EHR. If they're in the a EHR, uh, then there's an opportunity for them to be mined out of the EHR. And I mean, what this really sounds like is this will be a, a fantastic enabler to organizations that are trying to develop a more clinically focused supply chain or pursuing a cost quality and outcomes to be able to mine mm -hmm. product or device data along with outcomes and, and quality. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, we're talking about a government regulation here right now. Yeah, it, it only really affects the manufacturers right now, but this is something that could be quite, uh, quite a great tool for uh, supply chain, uh, supply chain management. Um, let's, let's uh, talk about the um, research that you mentioned, Natalia. You said there's some leading research and efforts that are ongoing right now. Why don't you share that with us? Sure. Um, this is an area I've been very involved in and I feel really, really passionate about. And, and um, this is information that actually a lot of people don't know. So um, I really encourage you, there's, there's um, references and links to some of the projects and publications I'm talking about. I really encourage you um, to download these, to share these with others within your teams and units and, and outside of your team to some in the clinical realm because I think this work is going to be very impactful on moving forward um, for UDI use. Um, first of all, there's a UDI demonstration project ongoing at Mercy. It's a large hospital system um, based in St. Louis. Um, the project is ongoing in their cath lab. It's actually supported by FDA funding. Um, and they're basically implementing um, UDI and electronic health record for cardiac stents. Um, a major goal is for post-market surveillance of coronary stents, but in the process of doing this, they have had to develop carrying a UDI across their hospital system. So they've had to involve supply chain, IT folks, the clinical folks, the people in the cath lab at all levels um, to really be able to, to carry that UDI across their system. Right now, publications are pending. I'm not aware that they're out yet. I keep in close contact with Dr. Joe Drazda, who's heading up this initiative. Um, but this is something very important to keep your eyes out about when publications start coming out of this. Um, a little bit of work out of our uh, research group um, in May of this year, I had a, a viewpoint published in JAMA on the value of unique device identification and its integration into health IT. Again, I encourage you, go to the link I provided, try to download that, share it with others. Um, it's very excited about this because JAMA is a very high impact journal and really the goal was to spread information to clinicians, to researchers, to policymakers nationally and internationally about all that we're talking about here. Just, just you know, the incredible importance and value and the importance for patient safety. Um, I, there was a project that I completed. I worked with the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. I surveyed their membership and I wanted to find out if an uh, orthopedic surgeon has to go in and replace a hip or a knee implant that's already in a patient. How do they figure out what's in the patient's body? And what I found out through this study is they spend a significant amount of time, the surgeon and their staff, they use multiple methods. There's a percentage that cannot be identified before they go to the operating room and even once in the operating room. So there was really perceived clinical um, impact and cost impact and one that I think that will certainly resonate with you um, is if you don't know what the implant is it has to be replaced multiple trays are being brought into the operating room. So those are 
some very powerful pieces of information that are already out there mm -hmm. about making the case uh, what UDI can do. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the national level efforts to that focus on facilitating the use of UDI? Certainly, the Brookings Institution is a very well-known, well-respected institution um, that now has an ongoing UDI implementation initiative. So this is really big. I mean, this is an organization that's very focused in part on health policy, and they have really decided this is important enough, and they are working on it. They're actually in the second year of working on it. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be on their work group. Um, so last year they had hosted a few workshops um, where they invited thought leaders and really talked about important issues, UDI in our IT systems, UDI in claims data, UDI for patients. Um, and I have to say supply chain has very much been a part of these conversations. Um, we're heading into year two where we're going to build on what we've done already and the ultimate goal is to develop um, a UDI implementation roadmap. Um, so again, I provided a link to the, this, the part of their website for this initiative. I would very much pay attention to what, what's coming out and the work that they're doing. Um, the Pew Charitable Trust, also very well known, respected institution, um, is also working on UDI. Um, they've had engagement with the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT um, for UDI and electronic health records as a meaningful use objective in stage three. They've had a focus on UDI in claims. Um, and really, just a few weeks ago, they hosted a presentation on UDI to the House Medical Technology Caucus. And at the national level, there are some uh, agencies also, not just FDA, mm -hmm. that are focused on UDI. Why don't you cover those, Natalia? Well, I already um, brought up the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT, or ONC. Um, and what's co recently come out of their meaningful use work group is a recommendation for UDI and EHR for implantables for stage three of meaningful use. Um, the thought is for it to be a menu objective rather than a core objective. Um, in the case of menu objectives, you would choose, I believe it's five out of, out of ten. Um, it's not final yet, um, but that has been a recommendation. Um, additionally, um, a recommendation for a future stage is that capability to electronically send adverse event reports. And as already brought up, per the final rule, UDI is required in adverse event reports. So it's electronically transferring UDI in the adverse event reports. Um, and lastly, there's a member of the FDA UDI team that is actually at Office of National Coordinator. She is there for a six-month detail focused on, on um, integration and UDI in ONC-related uh, activities and integration UDI and, and device information into the electronic health record. And there's, there's um, talk a little bit more about the adverse uh, effect reporting. Sure. It, in the, the final rule, I mean, obviously UDI use is beyond the purview of FDA. And so their, their final rule is, is really mainly tar targeted to labelers. That being said, UDI is required um, in adverse event reporting um, to the MOD database of the FDA. So that impacts manufacturers um, and providers. Um, it's also expected that there'll be a future requirement that whenever medical devices are referenced in FDA regulated activity, that UDI is used. So for the hospitals or patient care settings, this will impact medical device tracking um, and recalls. So we're talking about a potential requirement for healthcare organizations to use UDI uh, and, and p possibly not an option but possibly a menu selection and potentially an incentive mm -hmm. for them to use UDI through the meaningful use um, committee or work that we're doing right now. So um, l let me ask you this, what do organizations need to think about moving forward? Well, to me, there's four really critical areas. Um, education, um, certainly that's what you're taking part in today. Um, assessing process change that's needed, um, assessing software change and any upgrades that are needed, and really engaging in a cross-disciplinary, involving multiple stakeholders um, in this initiative because it is so, so important for patient safety. Dennis, um for hospitals that are thinking about this. Now, number one, um, it sounds like a great enabler to CQO. 
It sounds like there could possibly be a reimbursement implications through incentives if, C if, if UDI is used. So not, you know, we usually talk about the cost side of things, but it sounds like there's some quality, there's some safety, and possibly revenue and reimbursement implications here. What should hospitals be doing or thinking about if they want to plan ahead now? Right, so, so here's some ideas for, um, for you to consider as you move forward. Um, the very first thing here is you have to understand the rule. Uh, it's complex, um, there's lots of material to read, so understand the rule. Uh, find the knowledge centers in your organization. There are people that understand barcodes today in your hospital. There is some barcoding going on, so try to find those knowledge uh, centers. Educate and share information. Um, I think that's very important as well. <clears throat> uh, assess the impact to your current processes. So if you're going from a more manual process to a scanning process, how does that affect what you do on a daily basis? Uh, assess your system readiness. Do you have a system that will support the UDI? Uh, assess scanners and the data to support scanning for the UDI, uh, which we've talked about, um, um, uh, which we've talked about a lot already. Uh, acquire the UDI data. Um, we've talked about some ideas in this space as well. Um, Potentially, you're going to face a requirement to interface to the health record, so you have to look at how that might happen as well. Um, from the master data management perspective, uh, do you want to transact with the UDI? Is the UDI going to be in your item master? Will you issue purchase orders uh, and that kind of thing that use the UDI? Uh, and then finally, consider how you would do adverse event reporting um, by using a UDI and, and how you would enhance your recall with the UDI as well. You know, and I want to build on, on really the very good comments that, that Dennis has made. Um, I think it's really critical that you start talking across your organization and find areas where people may already be working and using barcode scanners. I found that in the course of my research that we start talking about it and they're like, oh yeah, well they're barcode scanning surgical sponges so they're not left in patients' bodies. And oh yeah, um, they're barcode scanning on lab um, specimens. Um, and certainly pharma is, is a model that's ahead of medical devices where they really often have these closed loop systems and the EMR systems, electronic medication administration record on the floor. Um, and then they're, they're using systems in the pharmacy where you can really learn what they've done, what's worked, what have been some of the, the obstacles. Um, but it's really critical to start talking um, really to those in the clinical realm. I know often supply chain has a unit in surgical services and they interface. Um, really important to find out what's happening in your organization because you actually might find something that you can then tag on to. Um, in this process. Well, pharma's got to be a model that everyone has to look at. It's been in place and it has all of these attributes uh, that, that we're moving into at UDI. Dennis, also, I mean, organizations that have been implementing data standards probably have learned some lessons that are very applicable to UDI. Why don't you talk about some of those leading practices? All right, so here are some ideas for best practices. Uh, first of all, if you have any UDI requirements, uh, if you want your uh, product data to come through the GDSN. If you want all GS1 barcodes, for example. Um, but uh, you should have some UDI requirements and you should issue those requirements to suppliers through your own contracts or potentially in line with the GPO's requirements. Um, uh, uh, in terms of acquiring, in terms of acquiring the UDI data, um, I think a best practice there is going to be uh, to uh, pursue uh, the data through a third party. Uh, so not only do you want to issue your UDI requirements to suppliers through contracts or, or through a GPO, you may want to use those sources to acquire UDI data as well. Um, now you do want to understand the barcodes that exist in-house. So some of your, or even most of your products will have barcodes already, uh, and then understand those gaps. And where there are gaps, you're going to want to apply your own barcodes so that you can do scanning from um, uh, you know, throughout the entire process, and those would be either the linear barcode or the 2D barcode, which I like, which I mentioned earlier. Now, one little tip I've heard from some folks is that they scan their inventory uh, to verify their stock levels and to test the barcodes. Um, 
Just a little known catch 22s just because there's a barcode on the on the product doesn't mean it actually is scannable. Um, I think you're going to have to work with your health record vendor for scanning. Uh, if you're scanning today in the pharma area, uh, your health record system is probably driving that scanning. You'll probably want the same system to do the scanning in the medical device area. Uh, I know some folks are starting to take a look at tracking systems, at UDI tracking systems, to take advantage of the UDI um, in, in terms of tracking the, data, the product internally and being able to have more efficient recalls. Uh, I think many suppliers are, are planning to put multiple uh, types of standards on their labels. So I would give feedback to your suppliers. If there are multiple standards used on your label, uh, indicate your preference. Uh, if your scanning is difficult or it impacts your workflow, uh, again, give that feedback to the supplier so they can actually put a barcode on the, uh, on the product that works. Um, I think the 2D barcode will be very prevalent. And if you're looking to get new inventory, you should be probably um, looking very closely at that 2D imager type of scanner. Dennis, Natalia, thanks to both of you. But now it's time for you to get involved in the conversation. And there are just a couple of ways to do that. If you're participating live on the internet, you can use the ask a question button on your screen, type in your question or comment and send it on in. Or you can send us a question or comment using email. Just send that to vhatvlive at vha.com and we want to hear from you. Now, uh, because both of you are, are so involved in the industry and have been able to, to help shape, actually shape some of what this looks like, I'm wondering uh, how could members of our audience, if they want to get involved, how, how can they get involved? Um, well, there's a, a million industry work groups. There may not be a million. There might be 900,000. But there are a lot of industry work groups. And so I would think it's easy to get involved with an industry work group. Uh, GS1 has industry work groups that you can be involved in. And so I think that's one very good way to learn. Um, there's a lot of associations who are now involved in this. Uh, of course, ARM comes to mind. Um, it, you know, a great group. And, uh, and you can get involved in the UDI through ARM as well. Um, some of the uh, more geeky and nerdy people like myself sign up for updates from the FDA on FDA.gov. You too could sign up for updates on FDA.gov. So three good ways to, to, to get involved with what's going on. Okay. And, and I'm also signed up, but I don't put myself in the nerdy <laughs> geeky category. Um, but also through um, SMI, or Strategic Marketplace Initiative, um, that's another group that's been very engaged with UDI. Um, but, but certainly your leadership is critical. I mean, within your organization, you know, in the industry, um, you have the opportunity to know information that others may not and to really start that process of talking to them and, and sharing uh, that information. To be honest with you, that's what I did four years ago. I started just gathering information and asking people a lot of questions, probably drove them crazy, um, and, and really felt this was very important. And you also can, can do that. So stay engaged, you know, take the first steps, um, and very much keep up on the national level efforts. Um, as I mentioned, I provided a lot of links for you. Um, we have a web page on our research group website um, that I'm trying to keep very up to date that has, you know, publications, a lot of links to the government. Um, agencies and, and their ongoing work, but also has white papers that I've done and, and other. I just had a piece that was published in Bloomberg DNA. Um, so those type of things are available for you to just peruse and see what may be helpful to download for your organization. Okay, great. And, and I never heard of UDI, I guess, four years ago, but uh, there's absolutely many ways for you to get involved. Uh, through ARM would be a very good one for your providers. If we have uh, manufacturers or labelers watching, uh, your industry associations have been very involved in UDI and producing uh, responses to the proposed rule and the, the gooded guidance. So that it's out there no matter what segment you're in. We have some questions. And um, I'm not sure you have an answer for this one, Natalia. Uh, hello, please repeat the name of the report uh, the, that Mercy is creating with the FDA. And I don't know that it has a name yet, but go well, ahead. It's, it's actually the UDI Demonstration Project oh. is what it's called. And it's funded through FDA's Medical Device Epidemiology Network. Um, so, and there was actually, I can't remember if I referenced for you, but certainly you can contact me and I can, will send you some references. Um, there are some presentations uh, about their work um, that I could send you. Okay, thank That's you, Natalia. Um, what are the differences between DI and PI identifiers? 
Well, let's see here. So the DI, of course, is the device identifier, and that would be the static portion of the UDI. And the PI is the production identifier, which would be the changing portion of the UDI. So the PI would include the lot number, the serial number, or the expiration date. Right, and the DI reflects the manufacturer um, and, and the model. And obviously, we discussed that some class one don't require PI, although the other classes do. And, and my understanding also from GS1 is that the, the G10 is more reflective of the DI, whereas there's another component that's added on that's reflective of the PI. Well, right, so just, just specifically with GS1, the G10 would be the DI, but you could embed in the barcode all the PI information, the lot number, the serial number, and the expiration date. So it, it's, um, <coughs> uh, but yes, you're absolutely correct. The G10 is essentially the DI. Okay. Thank you. Um, are products such as reagents and controls used in the testing of blood specimens included in this rule? Basically, the reagents you used in clinical lab. Right. If, they, if they're regulated as devices and they're, you know, class one, two, or three, yes, they would be. And I'm sorry, but off the top of my head, I don't know, to be honest with you. And it may differ depending on what the reagent is or the materials that are used. Okay, chances are they probably have uh, production information on them already, mm -hmm. but whether or not that's integrated into a, a UDI, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not totally sure about not right sure. now. Okay, um, our product, okay. Well, uh, I think we're out of questions, and um, we're, oh, we have another question. And we're waiting for that question right now. Okay, so um, one thing, Dennis, you talked about um, component <coughs> uh, convenience kits and the components are not required, uh, aren't, uh, but, but a UDI will be on the kit itself. If, we, if, if a manufacturer is providing products to a kit packer, don't they need to have production information on file that they've sent to a kit packer? Um, well, I... I guess that's possible that they do, but according to the UDI, in terms of the UDI, uh, this, the constituent parts of the kit do not need um, a UDI on them. Now, I think this is an interesting uh, decision. I know within the last few years we had a recall, for example, on um, antiseptic wipe uh, pads or, or pads, and in some cases people were breaking those pads out of a kit uh, and so I think it's problematic when there's not a UDI on an item in a kit and that item gets recalled. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize for that. We are waiting for a question to come in from, from our email inbox, which, by the way, everyone, you can use. just took a little longer. So please comment on the healthcare MMIS vendor's readiness to support UDI and the elements required. Well, um, so I, I think that's a really big concern of mine. Um, you know, in the planning area, I mentioned assess your system readiness, uh, and that's exactly what we're getting to, is do you have an MMIS system that will support the UDI? So I, I think, um, you know, without mentioning any vendors, there's three or four or five or, or maybe six vendors who can pretty well support the UDI, and then after that it drops off pretty quick. And even within the six that may be able to support the UDI today, if you don't get to the right version or you don't upgrade to the right version, you're not going to have that capability. I think this is a huge issue for the providers, uh, is how do you move forward if your system that you have today doesn't support the UDI and the cost to upgrade is, is large. So um, I think this is a significant issue and um, without naming any specific vendors, there's a handful at the top that are probably ready and there's a whole host of others who aren't. Thank you, sir. Um, how do I contact Natalia regarding documents for the FDA Mercy Project? I didn't see her email and the documents provided. Oh, it's easy. I'll just tell you. Uh, Natalia.Wilson at ASU.edu. Okay, thank you. Uh, where should I send this information for the first time learning about UDI in a hospital? 
Where should you send this information, learning about the first time? Well, if you're in the hospital, you're actually going to be receiving the information. Right. If you're a supplier, then you're publishing to the Good ID database. So hopefully I answered that right. question. So right now, there isn't anything for providers for hospitals to send. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, I guess this could be confusing. Hospitals are the consumers of the data. So unless they're... Um, you know, I described earlier that if you want a barcode, if you want to scan all your products and, and you look at your products and you don't have a barcode on a specific product and you, you put your own barcode on it, um, that's one scenario, but you don't have to submit any information to the UDI in that scenario. Right. In most cases, the suppliers are going to be putting the, the UDI information on their products and the hospitals will be consumers. Right. And Mike, I wasn't sure, of course, I heard the question differently, whether it's once they get information and they're educated and they want to move forward in their organization, where they take information within their organization. I wasn't sure if that was the question or... Yeah, I'm not sure either. Okay, well, yeah, go ahead. I'll address it because that's how, how I heard the question. I mean, I think in terms of the education and, and talking to people, I think it's to everybody, but basically within your team and within supply chain, but really some critical people, um, certainly um, the clinical leads in the operating room, particularly when you're thinking about orthopedics, um, when you're thinking about the cath lab, certainly there's such a huge IT aspect to this. Um, so your IT folks um, in the hospital, um, and certainly you know higher from that. I mean, I think that when you start to present some publications that really have clinical and business meeting, you may think about your CFO and your CEO and certainly your CMO. So just some ideas if that was the question. If not, you got more information. I have a question here about, uh, I think, new suppliers and suppliers such as Spine Metal, who make spine uh, plates and screws, uh, as they surface in this rapidly growing environment, how are they included in the UDI rule? Uh, and especially distributors of these products. So in the implantable segment, um, if you have probably distributors, uh, pods are probably one thing they're referring to. If you're creating, if you're manufacturing products, how do, you, how do they surface in the UDI? Well, I mean, these groups have to adhere to the rule regardless. I mean, there are certain based on class, class two, class two, class two, class two. Class three, class two, class one, with certain compliance dates. A lot of orthopedics and spine falls into the class two and is implantable. Um, so there's a compliance date that's less than two years from now. So, so my basic feeling is they need to adhere to this regulation regardless of who they are, based on if they're approved as a certain class, that's what they need to do. And I guess they'll get caught in, in the approval net some way, then, and UDI would just be one of the things that have to be done right, through that regulation process. regulation that they need to adhere to. Right. Um, when will the good or good ID go live? Do we know that yet? No, I don't think we know that yet. I don't mean to jump in, but because the first compliance date is nine months from now, and class three will have to submit um, good ID um, attributes information, um, on, on their products, um, I would think we're looking around that time that it goes live. But I don't know. I think that's something in the next nine months we're going to get a lot more information from the, the guidance that will become final and hear a lot more information of when this will be live. Yeah, certainly uh, it's a year away because, you know, the requirement for, for the manufacturers to start providing or populating it hasn't even started yet. Exactly. So. Uh, well, um, we're actually out of time now uh, for questions. So if we didn't get to your specific question, someone will follow up with you via email and make sure your questions are answered. Natalia, Dennis, I want to thank you not only for being here today, but Natalia, for your uh, efforts uh, with the consortium and trying to keep us all knowledgeable and focused on the importance of this. Again, it's not just a regulation. It has significant impact to patient safety, mm -hmm. patient care, and, and the supply chain. And Dennis, all your efforts over the years uh, and pushing forward, trying to push us all to focus on data standards and your work on the UDI rule and your service at Novation the last few years. I know that you'll be moving on soon, so 
thank you very much for your, for your hard work in this area. And thank you who are watching for taking time to join us today. And remember to fill in your online, fill out your online evaluation forms. We do use your comments in planning future programs. We absolutely read those. And to receive credit, by the way, for watching today's program, the web address and instructions are in the, in the accreditation section of your handout. And now from everyone here at VHA TV, I'm Mike Duke. Thanks for watching.